for all of those who are out there listening, thanks for joining us in this afternoon session um, of ACLIS 2020. Uh, as those of you who've been you know, listening to the other talks, you'll know that the way we've been managing question and answer on Zoom, which is always a little bit tricky, is that we'd ask you to write questions in the Q&A box or potentially in the chat box, and um, we'll read them out and answer them at the end of the talk. If it's really urgent, um, I'll be monitoring the things and maybe we'll interrupt Zheng Fong if it's absolutely urgent, need for clarification, but um, we'll try and leave the questions till, till the end. So if you think of any good questions, write them in the Q&A box and um, we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Um, okay, so everyone, um, thanks very much for joining uh, this afternoon session of Equus 2020. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Zheng Feng Ji from the University of Technology Sydney's Center for Quantum Software and Information. Uh, Professor Ji has made many fundamental contributions to the theory of up uh, to quantum, quantum computational complexity theory, and the talk you'll be speaking, the work you'll be speaking about today in this talk, speaking complexity at a distance, is one of my personal favorite uh, results of the year. It's rare to see a paper touch on so many deep fundamental questions in physics, mathematics, and computer science at the same time, and actually get resolved. Okay, so uh, when you're ready, Sheng Feng, we'll hand over to you. Uh, okay. Thanks, Michael, for the nice introduction, and thank uh, Mingxu and uh, Stephen for inviting me, uh, giving a talk at IQIS. Um, so this is a uh, uh, joint work. Um, um, with uh, Anand Natarajan, Thomas Vidic, John Wright, and Henry Yuan, and uh, the paper appeared in an archive earlier this year. And we have a version two uh, appeared in, in September um, to fix a bug uh, that we uh, depend on uh, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, version one. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll get that uh, very briefly in, in the talk. And, and th I've been given this talk uh, many times. And if you have uh, run into a previous one, maybe you can uh, uh, quietly walk away and save your time. Um, so let, let's start. First of all, I'll give you a brief history of the problem. And as, as Michael has mentioned, it has connection to um, areas in computer science, uh, mathematics, and physics. So, so the background of, of the results. We start with computer science. And computer science in, in the 30s, um, we, we just have the definition of what is computation mathematically. Um, and there are different models. And Turing machine is one of the um, models of choice. And uh, also around the same time, uh, Turing studied a problem called Turing's Horting problem. So given the Turing machine, uh, whether it will um, to, um, terminate or not. Um, and, and these are fundamental results um, on computation theory. And, and, and later on, when computers are invented in, in the 70s, complexity theory uh, become popular because we want to understand how, uh, what kind of problems we can efficiently solve. Um, there are different areas in complexity theory and, and most relevant to this uh, talk is uh, interactive proofs. So we, we consider computation um, and, and, and proof application, a concept from mathematics, um, study proof application from the computational uh, perspective. There are many important classes uh, in complexity theory uh, um, of this capital letters, MP, MA, IP, and so on. Um, these are uh, complexity class, the class of problems that a certain model can solve. And MIP is uh, a class that's well, most close to, to our result. And um, <clears throat> so from this line of research, there's a, a very important and celebrated result in complexity theory called PCP theorem. Um, and, and it's uh, a tool that we will use. It's, it's very powerful. Um, a statement, if you look at uh, um, the slides that I will show you on the next one, but like first we would um, briefly talk about the, the concept of efficient proof application. So say you have um, uh, a model where you can, you have two players, one is called a prover, the other is called a verifier. Um, 
And, and the, the purpose of the proof is to try to prove some statement to the verifier. And in, in the simplest model, the verifier is just a deterministic Turing machine. Um, and we ask what can the prover um, convince a polynomial time deterministic Turing machine? And this gives you the class of MP. Uh, there are two conditions to consider. One is called completeness condition. So for all true statements, um, there, there should be a prover strategy to write down a string and send it to the verifier and the verifier can, can check. Uh, on the other hand, if the statement is not true, then we, we require that we have soundness, meaning that no, no matter um, what the prover would do, uh, the verifier will reject the prover. So that's the, the, the very uh, important class of MP and we don't know what is MP, how, how it relates to um, the more well uh, studied class P and P versus MP is, is the most important problem in computer, um, computer science. Uh, there are also uh, variants um, of this uh, proof application model where you have considered um, interactions. So now proof and, and verifier can talk to each other and, and exchange messages back and forth. And in the end, the verifier would decide whether to accept or not. Even though this is like a very um, simple generalization and initially people think that it's a class very close to MP, but it turns out that uh, this interactive proof system has a very strong power and, and people later on show that it's actually equal to p-space. And in complexity theory, we uh, believe that p-space is much larger than MP. So having interaction is, is something um, uh, changed the power of interactive proof systems. And also around the same time, people considered um, a two prover setting, where now you have uh, Alice and Bob uh, playing the roles of, of provers they cannot communicate with each other. They, they communicate with the verifier. And, and the purpose of Ellison Bob, the, 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 the goal is to convince um, B of certain facts. And again, we see uh, uh, a very interesting characterization of the class MIP, and it's shown uh, that NIP equals to NXP. So by adding interaction and also an extra player, we can actually have a provable separation like from, from MP to NX because we know that uh, these classes are different. So we have problems that can be proved in this way, but not in, in, this, in this model. So that's uh, proof application. Um, and as I said, uh, a result that important uh, grow from this uh, uh, line of research is called PCP uh, serum. And it's about a, a slightly different model of proof application. Now you have a verifier and also a written stream. What the verifier would do is to flip all random coins. And based on the, the, um, the, the coins uh, outcome, you, the verifier would query uh, qubits from the proof. So for example, um, this, this R could be, um, if you have like an N bits of, of proof, then just to index constant number of um, uh, places would require log N bits. So, um, R should be uh, like at least log n to, to make, make this uh, problem interesting. Um, but what the PSP theorem uh, states is that uh, this is enough. Um, you, you, you have a strategy to write down a proof so that the verifier only need to flip uh, order of log n uh, number of coins and query uh, Q uh, constant number of places to, to have the same power uh, as MP. And, and this is a, a very uh, important result in complexity theory. Um, and it's related to an area called harness approximation and, and also uh, recently been used in, in delegation of computation classically. And the, the, the corner analog of this problem, um, there are different versions and, and it, one, one of them is, is considered the Hamiltonian version and it's uh, still a big open problem um, in, in uh, quantum complexity theory. Uh, we will be using this construction later um, in, in our um, work and so that's uh, about uh, computer science. We, uh, our, our result is also uh, closely related to uh, EPRs and Bell inequalities. We all know what an, uh, an entanglement an EPR state is. And, and interestingly, we can write this state in, in two different bases, um, the, the computational basis or the Hartmann basis. Um, and by measuring the state, you can see the interesting correlations. And, and this is what Einstein called spooky actions at a distance. And it even um, 
led Einstein to uh, question the completeness of quantum mechanics itself. And, and, he, um, and his co-authors had a paper in 1935 um, uh, on, on can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? And um, interestingly, uh, Bohr uh, in the same year, uh, in the same journal, there's the same title replied to, to, to this paper. So it's uh, a long debate of, of this weirdness of quantum um, entanglement. And, and this debate is only resolved uh, later on in, in the 60s uh, by John Bell with a uh, uh, very in, simple but enlightening uh, invention called uh, Bell inequalities. Um, so this is uh, one example called CHSH inequality. Um, and and what, what it says is that there's no local uh, hidden variable model can reproduce or statistical predictions of quantum mechanics. So this is what we can predict with a local hidden variable model, but um, we can show that in, in the quantum mechanics uh, world, uh, this, this value two can be violated I and mean, you can achieve two square root two. And this is a very simple uh, equation and you can do experiments to test uh, whether the, the world around us is classical or quantum. Um, and also along the line, uh, another, uh, important work uh, done um, in, in the 90s is by uh, Tillerson. He, he studied the um, Bell inequalities from a more uh, systematic perspective and asked a very interesting question. Basically, um, can finite systems approximate infinite systems? And we'll get back to that uh, question later on in the talk. And in, in mathematics, um, it, it, it's very interesting that the, the, the Related uh, study is also um, originated in, in the year, uh, uh, the decade of, of 1930s. Um, uh, I guess it's not a coincidence because uh, at, that, at that time, uh, von Neumann is trying to lay the foundation of uh, quantum field theory and quantum, quantum mechanics. So he studied something now known as um, von Neumann algebra. Um, and um, th this is like now a very uh, abstract mathematical um, object and the mathematicians take over, uh, try to understand this, the, the classifications of these uh, algebras. Um, and um, there's an uh, important, uh, nowadays we, we know it's an important problem uh, called Kohn's embedding problem. Um, it, it's, it's in the note um, uh, in the paper from uh, Kohn's paper in, in 30, 76. Um, I guess in, in the first 10 years, not. Uh, got attention by, by mathematicians, but later on, there are uh, different uh, equivalent problems that are known to be um, or equivalent to uh, constant embedding problem and, and becomes a central problem in operator algebra. So uh, you, you, if you do, a, do a, a Google search, you can see many conferences recently dedicated to the, to the single problem uh, in, in the past three years. So we know uh, different problems that are equivalent, uh, more importantly to us is that Chilson's problem. Um, is equivalent to Kohn's embedding problem. And that's something that's already known in the literature that, uh, that people have been able to show that at least in if and only if uh, correspondence between whether these two problems have positive answers or not. Um, so, so that's just uh, 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 end of our discussion on the background. We have uh, uh, physics, computer science, mathematics all started somehow in, in 30s and developed um, over the years and even though they look very different and doesn't um, have anything to do with each other, uh, we show that we can use uh, results in computer science and, and quantum information ideas um, and, and solve problems in physics and mathematics uh, using uh, uh, techniques um, mainly in, in, in complexity theory. So this is a, a result that uh, has a lot of connections and that makes uh, the, the claim more interesting. So um, I'll, I'll get, give you a closer look. So the, the object of study is what we call multi-prover interaction proof systems with uh, entangled provers. Um, so classically, the provers uh, share randomness. Um, now the difference now in quantum systems, we allow Alice and Bob share quantum entanglement. And this is uh, a work pioneered by Cleve Hoyer Toner Watches in 2004. And even though this is a very simple um, change, but it, it connects multi-proof and interact proof systems to Bell inequalities. And we can 
borrow a lot of techniques uh, from computer science because in computer science, uh, multi proof and her proofs has a lot of uh, uh, study and a lot of uh, deep results. And, and now we can borrow all of these uh, results and, and, and techniques to study bearing inequalities, complexity theory. So, um, for example, there are, uh, uh, in, in, in multi proof and interact proof systems, we, we have results including uh, low degree tests and parallel partitions um, and, and PCPs. Um, all of them are won't be natural if we think of the problem from the physics perspective because we won't be able to even come up with this kind of ideas and and this paper makes a beautiful connection that now it's all connected um, so we will uh, focus on a concept very simple concept called non-local games um, it, the definition of non-local game consists of uh, certain objects x y and A, B, so X, Y are the question sets and A, B and answer sets, they are finite sets. And we have a question distribution, mu on the question sets. So uh, mu is over X cos Y. So the verifier would sample according to mu, a pair of X and Y. And then uh, the verifier would send these questions, X to A and, and Y to B. Then Alice would reply an answer from the answer set A and Bob reply uh, answer from answer set B. So that's uh, how it works. And then we will have a decider, uh, a, a procedure D that maps all this question answer pairs to uh, zero and one. Let's say zero is reject, one is accept. Then we have defined uh, the, the game completely. But for our purpose, we would also consider a family of games. So um, we, we would define our family of game by a pair of uh, uh, Turing machines. So you can think of this as algorithms. Uh, the S algorithm would take inputs uh, index N. So we want N, you can think of N as size. We have a family of game of different size, uniformly um, defined by these Turing machines. So S takes uh, N and, and some other input. And the purpose of this Turing machine S is to sample the question. So you, you have, uh, you can think of the question as, as you have some random seed Z and then apply some functions L A and L B to it and Alice would only see LA of Z and Bob would only see LB of Z. And the, the algorithms uh, LA and LB are defined by the sampling machine uh, uh, S. Now, D is, is just uh, uh, defines how, how this function, the decider function works. So given the index and, and the question X, Y, A, B, uh, you just output zero or one uh, by a Turing machine. And, and we would define the nth game uh, uh, by uh, S of uh, hardwire, the, the, the first input uh, to N. So you would always consider size N. And, and this pair would, would give you a concrete uh, game over, over the, uh, in this family. Um, and we will consider two values. One is called entangled uh, value. Um, in, in that case, we would consider entangled strategies. The strategy you consider a, a a state and A and B are measurements. Um, so the, the, the psi is what's shared between Alice and Bob and A and B are the measurement operators. Um, so A, Alice uh, can, in, can depend on the, so the measurement A can depend on the, the input X that Alice received from, from the verifier, so X. And for O X, um, A is just an outcome of the measurement. So the sum, if you sum over A, this will give you identity for O X. And um, <clears throat> for any given strategy, um, you can consider a value. Basically, that's the probability that uh, um, the, 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 the players can win this game. So it's, um, you just write out the, write out the, the condition the, um, expectation over all questions, um, submission over all possible uh, accepted answers. And that's the probability of uh, given X and Y, what uh, probability you would have observing A and B. And, and, and you would take the uh, supremum of all strategies and that's the entangled value. Um, and, and the class that we would study uh, called MIP star, um, so basically it's uh, very similar to MIP but allow the Alice and Bob um, to share entanglement. And so the star here indicate that Alice and Bob can share entanglement. So MIP star correspond to the approximation of the value. And um, so that's, that's how we roughly how we define this class. 
if you have the ability to, to approximate the, the value um, VL star, then uh, you, you would understand the class uh, MIP star. Um, and we would also consider uh, a slightly different uh, strategy and value called commuting operator strategies and, and values. It, it's almost the same, but now there is uh, previously in, in, the, in the last slide, we have LSS and Bob system in tensor structure. Now it's uh, a single space. I choose a state in that space. And, um, to, but to, to emphasize that Edison and Bob are um, different parties, um, we uh, require that Alice's measurement and Bob's measurement are commuting with each other for all A, B, A, X, and Y. So that replaces the, the commuting structure, uh, the, the tensor structure with the commuting operator uh, structure. And, and you can consider what's the winning probability or the value of uh, in this kind of model. And it, it, the, the expression looks exactly the same except that you don't have a tensor because now A and B are acting on the same space. So you just multiply the operators, but you know that they are commuting. Um, and Chilson's problem that we talked about earlier, um, you can think of it as the question of whether these two values, the, the entangled value de defined in the last slide and the commuting operator value defined in this slide, whether they are the same for all gains. Um, so that's, that's a way to understand or to state Chilson's problem. And it's, it's interesting to mention that if only consider, we only consider a finite dimensional Hilbert space here, then these two values are always the same because um, uh, it, it's not obvious, but like it's, it's easy to, to, to see that all finite commuting operator strategies um, has a corresponding uh, tensor strategy to, to achieve the same value. So, it's, so the, the problem would only be non-trivial only when you consider uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So what, what do we know about these two values? Um, we have two algorithms. One, algorithm one is, is a, a trivial one. Uh, what you do in algorithm one is you, you do this um, exhaustive search for better tensor product strategies. Uh, with increasing Hilbert space dimensions and approximation precisions. You, maybe you can put in like an epsilon net on our strategies like all the operators, because once you fix the dimension, it's a matrix and you can put an epsilon net on that. And, and what, what this would give you is a sequence of values approaching this entangled value from below. So if you, if you increase like for higher dimensions and, and then finer precisions, um, you, you, can, you can approach this, um, uh, entangled value from below by definition, because that's how we define this value. It's not, not that efficient, but it's, it's an algorithm. Then there, there's some um, true mission that can do that. The, the second algorithm, algorithm two, is, is, is not very non-trivial. And, and so you can think of this as non-commutative sum of square STP hierarchies, or in our literature, it's called NPA hierarchies based on the uh, initials of this three authors uh, who read a paper uh, in 2008. Um, so, but the, the consequences of these two algorithms, um, it, 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 so this, this algorithm will give you a sequence of values approaching the commuting operator from above. So this is like what we have here. You have algorithm one getting values approaching to um, the uh, entangled value from below and algorithm two having values uh, converging to um, the commuting operator value. So the, the consequence that we have here, then if Tilson's problem has positive answer, meaning that these two values, remember that we, we define this Tilson problem as what these two values are always the same. If this is the case, have the positive answer, these two are, are the same, then we do have an algorithm to approximate um, this entangled value. Because what you can do, you, you can run algorithm one and algorithm two um, in parallel and, 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 and algorithm one would converge to this value from below, algorithm two converge to the, this value from, from above. Um, and if you can tolerate any epsilon error, the algorithm would, would finally terminate and give you the right answer. So this is uh, comp like um, the, the consequence, the computational consequence of Sirison's problem. 
made basically we would know that MAP star is computable. It is in R, uh, the, uh, the intersection of R, E, and co R, two complexity classes. So R is roughly corresponding to the problems that, that um, we, we normally call the decidable problems. Okay, so these are uh, some background on, on this. And I'll, now I'll, I'll switch to uh, the topic and give you some uh, history in, in this line of research on, in understanding the class MAP star. So um, basically we can divide the, the understanding of MAP star into three different stages. In, in the first few years, the first five years, um, so after the paper um, by uh, CT, CHDW in 2004, um, it, it basically we, we understand that this is a non-trivial problem. And um, one, one reason for this is like entanglement causes soundness problem. And it's already pointed out in that paper. And to see what this means, let's consider the, um, the game Magic Square game, uh, the game um, that, that often used in, in uh, re related research. So it's uh, a game of this form. You have like uh, a magic square, a, a three by three um, table. Each table has a, a bit, uh, entry has a bit, uh, x1 to x9, each has a, is a bit. And all these uh, rows, um, you require them to have uh, even parities and all the columns you require them to have odd parities. And of course, classically, there's no solutions to such a constraint system because um, if you compute the parity of uh, all nine variables, uh, the row says that it's, it's um, even and the column says it's odd, so no solutions. Um, and, but like once you change this into a, a, a game um, in, in this form, like you, you randomly sample a, a line or a, a column and, and then sample a variable. You give Alice the variable, you give Bob the constraint. Say we have sampled this column and, and sampled um, a variable, Alice would only see x6. Bob will see the constraint um, has to, to be x3, x6, uh, x9 equals to one. So Bob would need to apply the values of these three bits and Alice will reply the value of um, x6. And what we check is whether the constraint is satisfied. Bob's answer is satisfying the constraint required in the game and also that Alice's answer of value of x6 is the same as Bob's answer value of x6. So that's the game. Um, you, you, you have classical soundness. So this set of these kind of games have been studied uh, in the classical literature and, and it's classically sound, meaning that the, if there's like a system like this has no solution, then the, the game value is strictly less than one. But we all know that there is a strategy to win this game quantumly using two EPRs um, this game will have value one, uh, from quantum value one. So um, we, we think of this as uh, a problem for the soundness because think of this as the like interactive proof system for the fact that there's no solutions that you cannot convince me that uh, this, this uh, constraint system has a solution. Um, classically it's sound because the value is, is less than one, but quantumly you don't have any soundness because even though there's the system is not um, satisfiable, you, you still have a value one. So sun is as a problem. And, um, and this is asked, like lead us to the, to the question of whether entanglement could be a, like a bug um, in interactive proof systems. And for some systems, in, indeed, this is the case. And a class of games also initiated by uh, Tillerson is a structure of actual games. And based on his work, people can prove interesting uh, result um, that if you consider, only consider XOR games where, where the referees or the, the, the very first decision depends on the parity of the answers um, bits, then we would uh, have this complexity result that uh, parity MAP star standing for uh, these two provers uh, one round, uh, standing for this uh, class of games is in p-space. But classically, it could be as, as high, as hard as, as the next. And so you, 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 if you believe that these two classes are different com, uh, in competitive theory, you know that um, there are certain protocols, one, like once you have uh, entanglement, they are no longer sound. And it's not, 
even able to fix if you stay with this actual game uh, framework. Also, uh, a very similar flavor is unique games. In classical literature, unique games, you don't know the, the complexity, but in quantum unique games um, are easy and proved uh, very early, like in 2007. So, so in, that set, in that sense, the, the, the bug, the entanglement it is a bug for intractable systems and it's not able, to, like, unfixable. You cannot fix this bug. Um, um, in the next stage, um, trying to uh, like solve this um, soundness problem, people developed a, a set of techniques um, which we can think of as entanglement resistant techniques. Basically the, the idea is want to limit the power of entanglement in uh, intractable systems. And, and of course we have to go beyond the actual game uh, framework uh, and consider more general games. What you can do is you can do like confusion checks or add a third player using monogamy of entanglement. Um, and, and also certain tests are, are shown to be uh, immune to uh, entanglement uh, by design. So first set of results is that we can recover the NP hardness of non-local games by a series of papers um, in different, like maybe this is three player case, this is a two player case. Uh, and and that, that paper is, is uh, the constraint satisfaction uh, uh, version of, of these games. Um, and um, a, a breakthrough in, in that line is a result uh, by uh, Ito and Vidic, who showed that um, based on the, the multilinearity test, that MIP, star, MIP equals NX, that's the classical result, is contained in MIP star. So we can design for any uh, problem in NX. Uh, a protocol uh, MIP star. So in some sense, this fixes the, the bug that, of entanglement because you can always design a game um, so that um, even quantumly it's, it's sound. And um, the, the third stage of the development is, is about using entanglement um, positively in designing protocols. And uh, the first uh, breakthrough um, is by uh, Simons and Vidic, who designed a non-local game for QMA. So it's not QMP or NX hardness, it's QMA hardness. And, and it's interesting that it's uh, a combination of uh, uh, quantum error detection codes uh, used in, in the, in the uh, protocol. And also uh, you need to add some rigidity results um, to, to, to prove that you can, you can show that non-local games are QMA hard. And, uh, further developing this idea, uh, actually, we can prove um, better and better lower bounds for MIP star, um, like we have more E's, one, like each E stands uh, exponentially, you have a tower of exponentials. You have higher, like harder and harder problems in this MIP star, but there's a catch. Um, the gap is getting also um, much, much smaller each time. So the gap here is, is, is the, is the uh, difference between the completeness and soundness, so two, two numbers. Um, if, you, if this gap is, is shrinking, the complexity of this class is increasing. And um, so, uh, what, what, but like, um, th this tiny gaps are not very physical and, and it will be very interesting to, to think about like whether we can amplify the gap but basically what this says is that if you can do that, you can do gap amplification, then it, it will roughly lead to undecidability of MMP star because there, there will be no lower bound of this class. And that, that would be exactly what we would do um, in this work. We would prove that it's possible to, to, re, to do this gap preserving uh, versions of this compression technique. Okay. Um, uh, but like before our work, there, there are several interesting uh, discoveries. One is that non-local games with constant gap is extremely hard. And uh, it, it's by Nagarajan and Riddick, um, which more important to us, it developed uh, a primitive called quantum load degree test. Um, and from which we can uh, design a poly basis game. And uh, what, what this poly basis game is, is, is like a very efficient self-test for poly X and Zs on any PRs. And also, uh, uh, several months before our work is uh, the uh, result by Natura John Wright proving that in double exponential, uh, non-deterministic double exponential time is in MIP star. 
So this is the first time that we can show MIP star is different from MIP. And now you can see that it's actually um, like entanglement is a feature. With entanglement, you can design more protocols that, that classically it's not possible. Um, so the poly basis game is, is, is like this. Uh, as I said, it's, it's an efficient self-test. And efficient here means that, um, say you have any PRs um, and you want to play the game, the questions would, would have very short lengths. It's only poly log of in, in N. The, the guarantee of this test is that we, you can command the, the players um, to, to measure poly X or poly Z basis. Um, so the, there, is, there is this uh, measurement that we don't, we, don't, we don't know like what the players would use. So for each poly W, so W is X and Y, you send, you send this label poly W to um, Alice and Bob and um, they can perform some measurements and get back to you this uh, n bit strings, uh, supposed to be the measurement outcome. And um, um, as long as the, the, the strategy has value uh, at least one minus epsilon, then there has to be an isomorphism and then so that up to this have isomorphism, so uh, a, a operator is, is head operator. This, this is the real measurement that the player can use. This is uh, the, the isomorphism. Um, so up to this isomorphism, um, this measurement is, is just the honest uh, poly measurement. Um, you measure, uh, so tau wz is just poly x or z measurement and um, outcome is z. So that's, that's uh, the rigidity theorem that uh, the poly basis game give us. Um, and it's also um, uh, like in term build upon the quantum low degree test and, and, and the, cl the classical low degree test. So, so it's um, uh, a result that we use in, in our paper uh, as, as, a, as a black box. And this is also where the problem comes from. So in the version two, um, we, we, we notice that there's, there's a bug that uh, in, in the classical low degree test uh, quantum analysis. So we have to um, fix all, all of that, but uh, that makes the paper longer. Um, but, but fortunately for us, we, 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 we can recover uh, um, a weaker version of the low degree test um, and, and the proof for our purpose is still uh, like it's strong enough for, for our purpose. Um, so uh, the main result statement, uh, we prove MIP star equals to RE, so no algorithm um, can approximate the, the omega star because it's as hard as the Hawking problem. And, and the way that we show this is we construct a recursive gap preserving compression procedure for a certain normal form uh, two per one on protocols. And um, it's based on uh, like improving the, the techniques uh, used in, in the results of Matura John and Wright. Um, so there are several consequences of this result. Uh, we have discussed the background in, in physics um, and mathematics. So first of all, this is a, a result for um, understanding the, the complexity of MIP star. Um, and um, what, we, what we showed that um, is that this is a very powerful class. It's, um, and, and it's very unexpectedly powerful um, and very different from this classical analog. We also give a uh, negative answer to citizens' problem, um, meaning that there, there is, a, in, in certain sense, infinite quantum systems cannot be approximated by finite uh, ones. And, and, and built upon the, the equivalence um, between citizens' problem and Kohn's embedding problem, uh, we also uh, refute Kohn's embedding problem. So Kohn's embedding problem also has a negative answer, and that's an uh, a very uh, old uh, conjecture in output algebra. So um, do we have any questions? Uh, because in the uh, next part, I'll give you uh, an overview of, of the proof techniques um, that we use to achieve uh, the, the claim. If you have uh, any questions, I can uh, answer them now because the next part would get more uh, technical. Um,
uh, okay, this looks like there's um, a noise problem. To switch to to the building my microphone, is it getting better, Michael? Yeah, that's a little bit better. It was very slight before. Um, okay. I didn't want to interrupt yeah. you. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that is better. Okay, so uh, if, if there's no question, um, then I'll continue. So the proof overview, we, um, what we need is, is um, basically the compression theorem. Um, we have uh, alluded to the idea uh, previously. So w w this is the, the, the illustration. You, you start with a particle, you do the compression, you end up with a smaller one in the sense that the messages, so look at the verifier and the messages that it interacts with the prover are, are shorter. Um, and um, in that sense, we compressed the, the, the particle because the definition of uh, interactive particle or a game is from the perspective of the verifier, the, the, the question size, answer size, and how you do the uh, verification. And all, all, all of them are getting reduced. In, in the compression procedure. But if you notice that the entanglement is actually actually getting, um, um, the, the line gets thicker and indicating that you, you do need more entanglement after the compression. So players has to, to do more work. Basically the verifier delegating more work to the prover, uh, to the prover Alison Bob, uh, each round. So the compression theorem says there is an algorithm uh, called compress that, that once you input um, a game V, uh, so V is a pair of SMD. So it's a pair of uh, Turing machines. We have to, because of uh, uh, the, the nature of the, of the world, we have to consider a family of games and uh, they are defined by a pair of Turing machines SMD. It will output a compressed uh, verifier. Now it's again, a pair of Turing machines called S sharp and D sharp. So a pair of um, algorithms and uh, satisfying the following conditions. So for large enough n, um, basically we would, we, the, the value of the compressed one can simulate the value of um, the original one. So if um, v, so that, that's original game of a very high index two to the n, so very large game in, in the beginning is one. Um, so it, you have a perfect quantum strategy, then we we know that uh, for the compressed game, so that's compressed game on a, a smaller instance size, the value is still one. And uh, on the other hand, we have also have uh, soundness. So if the value of the big uh, game is at most a half, then the compressed one is also has value at most a half. Uh, for, for technical reasons, we would also require that entanglement is, is bounded. So the, the E here, is, is a, um, the number of EPR pairs you would need to achieve value a half. Um, and it says that um, the number of EPRs uh, in, the, like in the compressed game is at least uh, the number of EPRs that you use um, in, the, in the big game. And, and there's some uh, lower bound. Uh, that, that's also a technical uh, uh, issue that's, that's important in the proof, but uh, it's not that important for understanding the result. Um, <clears throat> so once you have this compression procedure, we can consider uh, Clean's, uh, use uh, Clean's, Clean's theorem to prove our result. So remember what we want to show is that MAP star equals to RE, and uh, we can only, like we, we will need to construct uh, a reduction. Uh, so give a Turing machine, we want to know whether it's uh, terminating or not. So that's halting problem. We want to reduce the halting problem to, to, to a game. And that's how we do it. So we define a Turing machine called d hot. What d hot does is first to simulate the Turing machine for some steps, n steps. And if m already hots, then we know m hots, right? And accept. So otherwise, we do a compression um, of, of itself. So, um, we compress um, this, a pair of Turing machines defining a game and and get back, uh, by definition of the compression procedure, get back a pair of three machines and call this S sharp and D sharp. And uh, we would now uh, 
accept uh, if and only if this compressed decision procedure would accept. So basically, D would first run in steps, and if it doesn't, like if M doesn't halt, uh, D will simulate uh, a compressed version of itself. Um, that's that's a rough idea. And um, um, but if you look at the definition of the Turing machine D hot, there's something tricky because you this is a body that you define this uh, Turing machine, but somehow um, it, the description the description of itself is being used in this uh, second line. Uh, you need to pass the description to to an, to an, another algorithm called compress, and that's valid because of the uh, clean circulation theorem. So uh, that's a well-defined Turing machine. There is a there is a Turing machine D hot satisfying this definition, um, and and we, we we see this very often in high-level program languages. But for Turing machines, it's 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 not that obvious, and you need a mathematical theorem. Uh, fortunately for us, we, we know that uh, that's just the Klein's recursion theorem. Um, and once we have that uh, defined. It's not hard to, to argue that uh, these two statements. So if M hots, then of course the value would be one because eventually the, we will simulate uh, long enough steps so that we will notice that uh, M is, is hotting. But if M is not hotting, uh, then the value at most a half. For that, we will need to argue the entanglement uh, using uh, the entanglement bound in the compression theorem. Um, so how do we how do we prove the compression theorem? Because that's now the the main uh, technical theorem that we need to prove our ideas. Um, that will take uh, several steps, um, but like only two of them are are uh, non-trivial, or like or introspection and PCP are are non-trivial. Oracleization is uh, pre-processing for the third step, and parallelization is to recover the gap. So as in the picture, we want to start with um, a big game and, and compress it. So the message is getting smaller. And this is how we do it. The first step, introspection, would reduce the, the length of the questions. The answers are still big. Um, now we do an oracleization step. So oracleization means that the oracle player would be able to play both Alice and Bob's role acting like an oracle, no all the answers. Um, the, the, the third step is do the PCP step. Um, as, as we have seen that PCP is, is very natural to reduce the number of places you need to check. And um, so what, what this step does is the verifier says to the players, send me a PCP proof of what you want to send to me. And that would um, reduce the, the size of the answers. And over the, over, the, over the procedure, over the steps, we uh, incurred a certain overhead in, in this gap between uh, the soundness and completeness. So we need to do some uh, repetition to, to amplify the gap. So that, that's why we need a parallel repetition step in the end. So overall, the, this is uh, the procedure. And these two steps, introspection and PCP, are more interesting. But like these two steps combined, it, roughly the idea is like, um, we have a protocol where the verifier says that uh, I don't want to send you an, a large questions. How about you to come up with uh, the questions uh, themselves, answer the questions, and prove to me that I would have accepted the, these big questions and, and and answers that you provide. So, and um, usually it's 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 very counterintuitive. How uh, you cannot do that uh, in, like in, in in most cases, but fortunately for us, we can do this with entanglement. So introspection is an idea introduced in uh, the Trajan Wright's uh, paper. Um, it's a technique for, uh, you can think of this as a technique for compression. And um, uh, as I said, like, introspection compresses the questions. So let's say we have a game, which is a big game, and uses certain distributions of this form. It, um, you have certain random seed Z, and apply functions L, L, A, and L, B to generate the questions. Um, this is uh, the big question. And um, so the random seed Z will eventually come from the Z measurement on the EPRs. 
So you, you would ask the player to share a lot of EPRs, measure them, and then uh, you would get the shared randomness and apply these functions on them to get the question. So the desired situation, the introspection step, the developer would send uh, special commands uh, intro to the players. And once the player received intro command, they need to reply a pair of Y and A. Y is the question sampled supposedly uh, LV of Z. And A is the um, answer that as if like Y is the question sent from the verifier to the prover. Um, and you would be able to measure something and get an answer A. So um, that's, that's uh, our wishful thinking. Um, but th the question, why would prover follow the command? Like you have want them to share a lot of EPRs and do the, do the correct uh, measurements and, and do the, uh, apply the correct functions L and LB. We, we give an example where L A and L B are linear functions. Um, so, so for example, L A is just a parity or maybe the parity of all um, outcomes in like Z measurement. Um, so in that case, um, enforcing that Y is equal to L A Z is not difficult because we can um, uh, ask maybe Bob to measure all the EPRs in, in Z basis. So, Bob will know Z, um, and we ask Alice to, to do the introspection and, and, and send back Y. We can check that Y and Z satisfy the, the equation uh, Y equals to LAZ. That's what we can, we can check. Um, but um, the, the, so that's easy because the sample comes from the, the how, how can we command the system to measure in Z basis? That's coming from the poly basis measure we described earlier. Um, and the, the equality, like uh, y, the relation between Y and Z is also easy to, to, to enforce. You just do this check. Um, <clears throat> what is not trivial is in, in games, we also want to hide certain information. Um, so Alice should only see Y as a function of LAZ, but no other information in Z. So there are certain um, Z observables. We don't want the uh, player Alice to be able to measure. And um, the, the idea is, is then to use Kessenberg on certain principle. You measure X on, on Bob's side in, in an incompatible basis, like measure X. Um, and that would hide information that, that uh, uh, a malicious Alice want to, want to uh, get. So uh, you, 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 what, what, what this um, tells us, is you, you apply some X measurement on Bob's side. And this is exactly the step that we, we rely on quantum entanglement for introspective sampling. So that step is, is really non-classical. We, we, we don't have any analog of that in classical um, uh, shared randomness. Um, and once you have the idea, it's not hard to um, uh, design uh, uh, certain checks to enforce um, these this relations. Um, but uh, I won't get into the detail, but like the, the, roughly the idea is, is simple. Uh, then uh, the second thing is we just mentioned how you can do it with linear functions, L, A, and L, B, but linear functions are not enough um, for, for, for our purpose. And our solution to this is we, we considered uh, a generalization called conditional linear functions. And that's, that's a very simple generalization. You just break the bits into different parts um, and you adaptively measure in Z basis, apply a function, you get Y1, and you can um, <clears throat> then define how, how do you measure the, the second register? How do you how do, you do this XZ measurement in, in that uh, second register? And then you, you measure um, the, the information and apply some linear functions again. So each L1 and L2 are, are linear functions, but like L1 is just a linear function, L2 depend on the outcome of the uh, linear function uh, uh, outcome in, in the first block. You, you consider certain um, uh, steps of this conditioning and, and that's the um, family of, of functions and distribution that we study. Um, so so that's, that's for the introspection step, um, once you have um, the, the ability to, to prove that you can 
do introspective uh, sampling for distributions defined by conditional linear functions, and that's that's okay. So for the um, answer reduction step, um, we uh, simply we, we just use uh, a, 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 a probability check of proofs. Basically, the idea for the verifier is to to ask, ask the the provers to send back a PCP proof. The the, the oracleization is then used as a pre-processing because the PCP proofs uh, relied on the information of, of everything. So we, we need to have a, a prover um, oracleized, so knows all the answers of Elson and Bob, and that's that's a technical uh, requirement of what kind of protocols we, we can work with. And fortunately, there are games satisfying all these constraints. We can have Elson and Bob whose measurements are commuting um, even though, like even, even when you uh, measure on the same system. So Alice and Bob measurement are na naturally commuting because they're acting on different systems. We would further require that Alice and Bob's measurements are commuting even um, uh, measuring on the same system. And, um, and of course, we would need to make several changes to the PCP construction to make sure that the question distribution induced from the construction remains classically uh, uh, conditionally linear. So that's the overall uh, uh, techniques. And, and I'll briefly mention what we updated in the version two of archive paper. Um, so um, uh, as I said, uh, the, we, there is a problem for um, the, the quantum soundness of a classical little bit test. Um, and, and we have to replace this. So it, it's a bit scary that uh, you have built a, a tower of, of reductions so each, each layer is, is just a, a module that we use. And, and on the ground is, is a very um, fundamental one is, is a quantum soundness of the classical load degree test. And um, um, what we found in that uh, archive paper is, is, is a weaker version of the previously known uh, uh, quantum soundness of classical load degree test. We have to uh, change the, the game a little bit and also the, the guarantees that we can prove is, is much weaker, but fortunately it's, it, it suffices for our purpose to build the tower um, up. And um, so this is used in the quantum load we test and we have to uh, update that. And that's in the uh, appendix of the version two um, paper of, of this talk. Um, and once you have that, you can build up a poly basis test and that's used in, <coughs> sorry, that's used in introspection um, and you can build like this four steps, um, main steps in our paper. Okay, so to conclude, um, we, we have uh, shown how to do recursive gap preserving compression of, of normal form two player one round protocols. And um, um, we have shown a compression theorem. And once you have compression theorem, you would be you use a clean recursion theorem and this would give you RE in MAP star. And then this equality then follows uh, because MAP star is in RE. This is uh, easy result, following by the, the first algorithm that we just uh, introduced. Um, and it gives negative answers to both Sirson's problem and Kant's embedding problem. There are certain interesting open problems. The first one is, can we have simpler proofs? So version one of the archive uh, paper has 165 pages. Um, now we have like add an uh, appendix, so it grows to two, 206, and we also have an extra paper uh, resolving the quantum soundness of the classical Ludwig test. It's uh, 103 pages, so in total there's more than 300 pages, and it's really hard to to digest and to verify. Um, um, but like it, it's all built on a modularized version. Um, we it's, it's very hard to, to, to do um, significant implication um, other, uh, unless you have uh, a very different technique uh, to prove it. And also there's um, a complexity theory uh, question. You can consider what is MIP star with commuting, MIP with commuting operator strategies. Uh, we conjecture that this is uh, exactly Q co -RE, um, but that would require um, a, a a lot of more work. Um, the third one is very open, like uh, what, what kind of applications do we have? This is a very theoretical result, a mathematical 
has mathematical interest, but can we borrow some of the techniques in constructing um, more practical applications in quantum interactive protocols? Um, and with that, I thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Yangfeng. Um, I hope many people are out there clapping virtually out there on the internet. Um, so thanks very much for your talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can raise your hand or, or write them in the Q&A. Um, I'll have one to kick us off a bit. I mean, you, you briefly mentioned, are there any applications? Mm. This, obviously, this is a very, 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 very theoretical result. Mm. Um, and you're really pushing a bunch of extremes in trying to resolve this question. Yes. Um, but I guess what would be the first starting steps for thinking about an application, you know, demonstrating this, uh, mm -hmm. that allow us to, mm -hmm. to demonstrate this? Yeah, um, I think one possible direction is to try to apply the techniques, um, for example, the introspection um, and, and PCPs in, um, designing more efficient uh, delegation protocols. You, you have the technique, but like we require certain properties of the protocol to start with, and that's not really easy to satisfy. Um, so I think like even like this is a question asked by Kaming in, in, in the talk, right? Um, and, and, and I thought a bit more about it and, and it seemed to me that there's, there's no known constructions um, that efficiently delegates uh, quantum computation, where the verifier is is sublinear. Like you have you have um, a verifier that's significantly efficient than the um, quantum verifier you, over a protocol you start with, because in, in quantum computing, I guess there are two levels. First, you want to classic, like make, you make the verifier classical. You call the delegation of delegate all the quantum computation to to the provers. Then that's the first. Usually, but usually this would end up with a uh, verification protocol where the very first running time classically is, is much longer than the very first running time quantumly. Um, but, but I don't see there's a fundamental uh, reason that this would be the case. It should be, the pos it should be possible to have uh, results similar to the classical delegation um, setup where you have a verifier which is really efficient um, and, and delegate all the hard work to, 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 the, to the provers. So, and, and I think that techniques um, developed in this work should be um, useful. And maybe, maybe one um, strategy to do this is try to consider what, what are the distributions that are introspectively sampleable. Uh, we have CR function uh, distributions, but um, it may not be the, the final answer. Like it, itself is a very interesting question. Like what, what are the distributions you can, you can introspectively sample? And, and if, if you can increase that class, you can apply this technique uh, like to, to a broader application scenarios. Okay, thanks for that answer. There's actually a question here in the q and I'll, I'll read it out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hope I'm saying this name correctly, but Jun Takahashi mm -hmm. has asked the following question. Thank you for the nice talk. My non-expert question is this, is the proof ultimately constructive or not? Would it be a straightforward work to explicitly show how two provers sharing some amount of EPR pairs would try to convince the verifier for an actual particular problem. Like the halting problem of a go back conjecture counterexample, the King Jury machine. Mm. Um, I, 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 my microphone is enabled, so June, you could you could answer your question directly. Okay. Um, thanks for unmuting me. Um, I hope you can uh, yeah, yeah. hear me clearly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my my question is, um, would it be easy to have a concrete example of actual um, quantum provers um, really um, so explicitly showing the protocol how how they would actually do it? And I yeah. guess that boils like, down to, our, our to how is is. It, it's constructive. It's there's there's nothing that we use any um, uh, proof study that that only prove the existence. I guess like it's a step by step uh, compiling of strategies. But usually the overhead is really big. I guess um, the, the problem of, of the strategy is like you don't care about um, the, the the details or how how 
complicated game would end up, end up we just have a like very general strategy to compile compile uh, input strategy to, to the next step. And this would like the, the game in the end would be huge. Um, I, I would I would suspect that there might be some like different strategies to construct such games. Um, like showing, uh, there should be there should, there should be uh, like an, an answer to your question much elegant than our construction. But maybe it will be a very different topic. Like you, you will involve um, many many techniques from uh, operator algebra theory. Um, I guess they, they, they know much better than <clears throat> than us. I know like certain certain examples of games that they believe um, that would have this feature, but um, um, well, for our construction, is it's a compile like in each step you would increase the game uh, in terms of size. Um, we would only very theoretically say that the, you can compress it like it's very large constant um, times um, some polynomial in polylog in 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 in, in in the size, uh, input size. So it, it, it's not that uh, uh, not clear, like what, what is the game you end up with? You start with some, some Turing machine or certain undecidable problems. Um, you, 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 can, you can theoretically build up uh, a game. You can, you can write it down, you can define it. Um, but, but it has to, has to be uh, defined in, in, a, in a very, uh, hierarchical way you you don't you don't see it uh, clearly what like you can define the, the the behavior of the game very easily that that's my my uh guess that, i see thank you know. thank you very much yeah <laughs> thank you for the question yeah i think it's a very interesting one like can we find more um um like in a sense understandable like you know why this is happening but mm -hmm. what we are doing is right is, you know, you know why this is happening uh, by a series of uh, reductions and arguments and relying on all, all the steps are correct. But maybe there's, there's just one, one single example that you can, you can see everything uh, uh, crystal clear. Yeah, that, that's possible, but I, I have no idea like how, how to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've got a bit of a time there, so maybe we should we should wrap it up there. I don't think there are any further questions online right now, so maybe we'll thank you everyone again for an excellent talk and for answering questions. And I'd like to remind everyone that the Gather Town is open for people to go and have other discussions and to look at some of the other talks and presentations. Um, and we'll be reconvening. I think it's at six p.m. Uh, Sydney time for the next session. All right. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. <laughs>